Do you know the Bible says that there should be public reading of God's word? Have you read that in the Bible? Yeah, which Sitnam doesn't practice regularly. Today I want to ask my wife to be the Bible reader. Before we go to the text, we must always preach what is in the text. And the text is the Bible. Are we together? That's my wife, Dr. Rebecca Nganga. She is the Bible reader for today. my name Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior I am grateful to God to worship in this very familiar place I have spoken from this pulpit uh, some time back and continue to speak about the goodness of the Lord until he comes or calls me home I am I'm grateful to belong to the family of God born again I said and I uh, still repeating uh, I think it was last night uh, I was just talking with my husband and asking, or rather he said, you are coming with me to Karen. Um, I hadn't heard he was coming to Karen. We, we go many places. And so I had to really figure it out. And so I'm here in Karen today with him. And uh, so I asked him, I think it was even this morning, uh, what are you going to talk about? So he said something family. Uh, and so as I was coming, to, uh, since I was left behind, uh, watching uh, television just put something on, and uh, the message that was there, I know some of you are watching with me because uh, if you come for second service, it means in the morning you had time for worship because you need to worship before you come to join believers. And um, it's someone that one of the topics was, uh, what do you do when you go home and find there is nobody? There's no smoke, there's no sound. You know, like, uh, you know, First Samuel chapter 30, when David came from fighting to find nobody at home. And this speaker was saying that his mother told him, when you have not nowhere to go, when the world becomes so rough, you go home. See, when we are fired from our places of work, we go home. See, when you are sick, you go home. Yeah, I mean, home is where you are yourself where you have no titles. Here we can act, but at home, there is no wig. You have no shoes, nobody. I mean, you are known by your name or your reference, uh, not uh, those others we use here. Th those are okay for the public, but you know home you are yourself. It's where people know you by your real name, the name that was called before you knew yourself. And so the home, I just thought about it. Doesn't the Bible talk about home? You remember that home of Jacob? Where he finds his son is sleeping with one of his wives. Isn't that home? Home, there can be infertility. That we are here in the public, but there's no conception. Everything is available. Isn't that what happened to Hannah? Everybody is speaking. People are making sense out of their lives, but you're not making sense out of your life. And at home, is where the struggle is. Home is where you can have a husband like Abigail, Nabal, whose meaning is a fool. And, and many, I mean, I know many, I mean, home, what don't we have there? Home can be a place of many tears. A home can be a place of pain and yet a place of formation. We are talking about families. We are talking about our credo. We are talking about living together, the values by which we live. And they're just thinking, home, what a fertile topic to talk about. Home is a place where Jeremiah was born when the, God says that he knew him before he was formed in his father's womb. But chapter 16, he tells him, you'll not get a spouse. You'll be single for all your life. And that's God's calling. There's nothing wrong. Don't play, pray. Don't come to sit them where one time I came and everybody over that was asked to come, sat there, prayed for. Because it must be, some, something must be very wrong. I was saying, which Bible are you reading? What was wrong with Jeremiah? That God, in no, knowing all about him, did not include us. But friends, we are here to talk about family. I was asked to read Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because when you have nowhere to go, do you know you 
You have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. The tears at home must be cried before the Lord. Do you know, home of Jacob, which I've just mentioned, Joseph was born there. Who could not sleep with a woman? Because how can I do such a thing? I'd sin against my God. Same family of Jacob. Same family when God is fed up with his people and they are taken to Babylon. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in homes in that community. Yes, the seed of those who know their God are born in those homes where there are chaos, where we can't even figure out what is happening. But God is present. And when we have nowhere else to go, friends, can we run to where God is found? That is where, when Naomi experienced laws with capital letters, Laws of husband, laws of sons, laws of everything. First, at 6 of chapter 1 of uh, Ruth says she heard that God had heard about his people. What is the message that you are hearing? How is it connecting you to eternity and to God? Families is not where security is. It is in the living God. Staple marriages like that of Ananias and Sapphira can be leading you to your an early death. It is in knowing who God is and loving the Lord your God with all your heart, loving to spend eternity with Christ, that home begins to make sense. It is the word in you that you encourage yourself with when it is the word of God. May I read Deuteronomy chapter 6? Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frame of your houses and on your gates. May God bless his word. Amen. <clears throat> Today is about a family that founded on a rock. The other name for that rock is Jesus. And that's what we are saying that we want to ask you, when you are running your own marriage, do you run it with eternity in view? I God started the family. And why it is important for you to act right in the family, because it could determine whether you go to heaven or hell. My wife has emphasized that if we are going to talk about a family based on a rock, it must be a family that is seeking to go to heaven. That the home, home on earth is only a temporary direction to a home in heaven. And that if you have a good home here, there is still the question do you consider eternity as your home? She gave the example of, um, of, um, of our friend David. He has been fighting. He comes home to find that everybody 
have been captured. They have no wives, no children, no property. They just found a dry place without anything. They, he cried, and the whole 600 of them cried until they could cry no more. Then he started saying, we are here because of David, and they were planning to kill him. You know the story, isn't it? Now that home doesn't exist, <laughs> my wife asked you, where is home? And David realized his home is not just physical. Home is in God. And so he encouraged himself in the Lord. That's really the question during this family month you need to ask yourself. Although we are talking about the, the family we have on earth, the greater critical issue is, are you part of the home in heaven? So that even if you came and found all people are dead, that's what happened to Job. Everybody died. He still is able to encourage himself because he also belongs to eternal home. And that's really what we need to talk about. Now, during this second service, I will not participate, I will not handle that because I'm told all I said was recorded. And since you are literate people, it's easy for you to go to the YouTube and hear the recording. Is that okay? So I now can go to part two. So tell the people who came to the first service, they have no idea what I'm telling you. They did not hear it. And you also don't know what I told them. So you also have to go to YouTube. Isn't that a fair thing? Everybody goes to YouTube. Because for God having given us these gadgets, then we use them. So it's one topic, and the topic is about basing your family on the rock Jesus Christ and having eternity in view. And if you choose to listen to this second part without the first part, it will still be okay. It's not compulsory for you to listen to the other part. Because each part is complete on its own. I told the first service that the, a Christian home, a good home, a biblical home, is number one, a human development center. That God's intention was to create families so that they can be the, they can be the center that will develop the next generation which is where our text came from, Deuteronomy chapter 6, that in order to produce a good, responsible future generation, the family is given responsibility. Sometimes we are saying the teachers, sometimes we say the government, but the Bible says the parents. It's not even the work of Sunday school. Sunday school may be foreign aid, but the responsibility belongs to the children. It's the children, the, it is a Children's Human Development Center. And you need to ask yourself, how well are you doing it? Especially because if you are doing it well, children will know this home, but they're also going to know the home in heaven. They will understand that even if their father was to die, when they are still in Saturday 3, that will not stop them going to university. Because their father is not the source of their livelihood. Their father is only a vehicle for where the source is. And what is the source? God. Does he die? No. So, have your children, do your children know that? That you are not that important, you are only a pipe. A pipe. You know, you don't pay the water bills because of the pipe. You pay it because of the sumo adam and the kine. Am I right? Because that's where the water comes from. That's why you know if you have a problem with your pipe, a frog has entered. It's not a big issue. Just call a plumper, they remove the frog, the water flows. But if they tell you the kine is dry, that's a serious problem. Am I right? Similarly, your children need to know <laughs> that the father and the mother are just a vehicle. The real source is God. And even if they were to disappear, the child will still realize their future. And I know that testimony because my father died. And it was difficult to even imagine I'll finish high school. But I finished university on the basis of God the provider. Am I communicating? So it's important to understand when you're talking about home being, or rather your family being a development center, we are saying, teaching your child not to regard you as a source, to regard you as a pipe. And the pipe can be replaced 
if you have had a, been having a green one, it came to a red one. The color will not stop the water coming. And that's really what your children must know. That their parents are not sources, they are simply right. And that's a very, very important thing for, for you. And then we say number two, home is a personal retreat and recharge center. That you need to come to where everybody with all the struggles outside there, they know when they come home, three things will appear. Number one, the family will receive them, not to fight them, but to encourage them. That's why it's a retreat center, isn't it? That my mother will receive me, even if I come without anything. You know, like, um, I, I, I've been involved in preaching for a long time, and sometimes I'm preaching in Yandarwa, where my mother was, and I wonder, do I have a few minutes? Why don't I rush and greet my mother? Now, some place, some people, you can't greet your mother without anything. Because you see, she expects something, isn't it? You go empty-hearted, it will become a chaos and uh, a story for all the siblings to hear. But I had a mother who was a Christian. So I would go there, greet her, and give her absolutely. What is the even what different is that I own, she would not allow me to drive without potatoes in the car for the grandchildren. Although I gave her nothing. That's what your home is supposed to be. A retreat center where people don't come in order to give. They come to retreat from the fighting outside. And that's what your home is supposed to be. So if people know they come home in order to be grilled, they'll look for another center. Am I right? Yeah. And by the time your children and your spouse are looking for another center to run away from you, please be aware you're not going to heaven. Because you see, it's as if... It is heaven that is asking you to be the kind of mother who makes home a retreat center for your husband. Now you have become a lioness. Now, so he must look for somewhere else to escape. He will escape. And it, that might lead him to hell, but the two of you will be there. You for chasing him and him for running away. It's very important to understand as we are talking about this, that home must be the retreat center. And of course, you understand why it will be a retreat center. Because it's also the unconditional love center. The unconditional love center, we say it in the first service. That means people are loved. And you ask, why does my mother love me? If you find a reason, then there's a problem. Your children should never find a reason as to why you love them. You simply love them because they are your children. Am I right? That's why the, your child that becomes number one from the front and the one who comes number one from the back, they come home happily, both of them. The one that is number one from the front and the one number one from the back. And when you talk about them, you don't talk about them in possessions. It's irrelevant. You are a mother and you had the pain for both. So it doesn't quite matter that this one is number one from the front and the other one is number one from... Do you understand the meaning of unconditional love center? Yeah. One of them is giving you real trouble. They are really messing up. You are called to school regularly. That's not comfortable. But he needs to understand you hate sin, but you don't hate the sinner. It's not easy. But the boy must know you hate sin. It will send him to hell. And you don't want your own son to go to hell. But there's something that you know. <laughs> you love him. And as bad as he is, he can always come. That's a Christian family we are talking about. And conditional love, center, and to be important. Then we actually talked about the worldview, foundation, center. And I don't think I have enough time to go to that. You may need to go to, to still go to that first service. Today, this time, I want to emphasize the reason why we become families. In fact, one of the things that I have to admit, that a lot of families, like my wife said, have a lot of trouble. Am I right? Source of trouble. And yours may be similar. In fact, if you find a marriage without any trouble, either both husband and wife are fake, or one of them is fake. It's important that I've written a book called 
overcoming marriage challenges. And I say, and my wife actually talks about that, that it's like God created us for trouble. Because a woman is so different from a man, if you put them together, what do you expect to produce? Trouble. Because a woman does not think like a man. So women are always wondering what is wrong with men. There's nothing wrong with us. We are simply men. Now you need to understand. <laughs> you need to understand until you accept us as we are. My friend, you keep seeing a doctor. You need to come to where you know your husband can never be a woman. So accept him simply as a man. They don't think he's your man. And you know men are also asking the same. What's wrong with a woman? <laughs> Mothoni Rikimani wrote a book, What Does a Man Want? And it's basically, there's nothing really wrong. It's God himself who instituted it. He created women so different from men that for them not to have trouble would be strange. I'm not communicating. So it's important to understand that if you are to look for a family without any problem, then you are likely to be looking for angels. They can't be human. If they are human, and you know we like calling our girlfriend, angel, my angel. Now, my friend, continue calling her your angel, but if you propose and she says yes, Haya, you mean you are not an angel? Because angels do not accept proposals from men. Am I communicating? So even before you marry her, you know she is not an angel. And because she is not an angel, she will annoy you. Am I communicating? So when you talk about families, good families are not families without troubles. Good families are families that accept each other as they are. Good families are not families where their children are wonderful. <laughs> good families are where the children are accepted exactly the way they are. So good family, you must understand. Christian family, biblical family. And my wife quoted quite a few, isn't it? Each of them with a problem. And yet, they are the families we see. We don't see a single one where there is no, no problem. Peter's family, which we have been told about, the mother-in-law was sick. Am I communicating? Every family has a problem. And if yours has none, be very suspicious. Be very suspicious. Those are the kind of families where people rise up one day and kill everybody. Then the neighbors ask, hey, they have never quarreled. That is the trouble. The fact that they have never quarreled. Because the person is accumulating, accumulating until they burst. When they burst, he says, we all must die. <laughs> so my friend, <laughs> if your wife keeps quarreling you, please say hallelujah first. <laughs> because it means she loves you. Am I communicating? It means she loves you. Just imagine going to a restaurant. You look at the way the restaurant, the, the waiters are, you look at the way the food is, you make up your mind, I'll never come back. If you make up your mind, you'll never come back. Will you complain? No. When you complain at restaurants, it's because you intend to come back. So similarly, if you have a wife who never quarrels, it's because she's there need to leave you. So you need to understand. <laughs> if she really loves you, she will complain regularly. Am I communicating? Yeah. If you find a husband whom you annoy and he's just smiling, please ask for prayer and fasting. <laughs> because you have no idea when he reaches the fasting point, what will happen? So I want to establish for you to understand that the troubles in marriages are created by God himself. Because of making a man and a woman marry and then creating them very different. You know, women think very different from men. Am I right, men? You keep wondering, this woman, what have I done for her? You don't even know what to do. So you need to understand clearly that the reason why there are differences in marriage, it's because God created them like that. For them to have differences. Why? He, is, he wants to teach you how to accept people the way they are. Now, if you don't learn to accept people, you can't have a good marriage. Good marriage is to have a son who works very hard and still becomes number three from the back. 
Because he used to be number one. Now he's number three from the back. He's, he's trying to be, and you feel so excited that he was number three from the back. He normally gets Ds. One day he comes home with a D plus, and there is a party. Now, you need to understand, you have accepted the boy, and you know he has other gifts. His gift does not intellect, include intellectual ability. The child needs to understand, even if he can't do well, he's accepted the way he is. And it's very important to understand. So those differences will be there. But I'm asking, why should you want to be in a marriage? Why did God put us in a marriage? Yet all those differences are there. You know, sometimes you just want to be alone. But unfortunately, you made a mistake of marrying. So being alone, why are you being alone? Are you sick? No, no, I want to have time alone. Why? Is it that you have another woman? Now, she is making the things worse. What you are coming home to do is to retreat. But the questions are coming fast and furious. And you have a problem. So with all those challenges, the question is, which is my second, my, my, I told you in the second service, I'm emphasizing the relationship between the two heads of the family, the husband and wife. Why does, he, does God still decide to put us in a marriage? I think number one is because God knew that you needed a companion. And you have a companion for life, for life who loves you unconditionally. In other words, in a good marriage, divorce is not an option. It doesn't come in. My friend, let me tell you, if divorce is an option, it will, you will not last before you have divorce. If you wanted to prepare a dossier as to why this man must be thrown out, you write pages. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. You know, all to show you why this man, I cannot stay with this man. The reason you stay with him is three things. Number one, because you know God hates divorce. Number two, because there must be a ministry God knows only you can manage. If that guy had married anybody else, they would have been dead. But you are an expert in dealing with a lion. And somehow, God has given you grace to handle the, the lion. So you need to understand why you must stay there. Because if you move out, you lost your ministry. Because your ministry was to domesticate a lion. <laughs> Am I communicating? So why marry? Because marriage is a ministry. Am I communicating? Yeah. And then... God puts in very strong language. He says, if you don't look at that woman who has given you a lot of trouble and try to relate well with her, there is no need of going to Catalonia because you'll be wasting your time. God has put a ceiling that will hinder your prayers. Have you read that in the Bible? Yeah, I thought that is making my wife too powerful. Now, but you need to understand, he is saying, your prayers, without sorting out issues with your wife, is simply mouth the exercise. A waste of time. I mean, it should be talking to ladies because they're the ones who pray more, isn't it? Yeah, instead of dealing with the issue at home, they ask for one prayer after another. Waste of time. Mouth exercise. It's very important to understand. We're asking ourselves, why did God make, make us go into marriage? Because he knows every one of us needs a domestic doctor, a domestic ministry. And he gives you a girl whom he equips to handle you. We have been married about 44 years. And if you were to ask Rebecca to write a dossier on why I'm the wrong man, she doesn't require one page. She requires an exercise book. So the reason we enjoy our marriage together is because she accepts me the way I am. Am I communicating? God knew, without the Rebecca, I would not be who I am today. You know, the other day some young men were asking me, I like, I, I, I preach a lot, and the young men like moving around with me. So the other day, in fact, on Friday, on Thursday, I was speaking in the KSM National Convention in Makweni, and I had a young man, and he was really greeting me. 
about marriage. And so he's asking, how come you are married and you are so involved in ministry? I said, I always tell young men, if you want to be involved in ministry like me, please marry a Rebecca. I have no, there is no way I would be as involved in ministry if Rebecca had said no. If Rebecca never understood my calling. So she was prepared specifically in order to produce a John. Am I communicating? And you need to understand you are who you are because of who God gave you. You need to understand sometimes the reason why your patience levels have improved is because you are given an impossible wife. And initially you always lost your temper until you realize this losing of temper could get me to hell. So you asked the Lord for a special ministry. You reminded the Lord that the fruit of the Spirit includes patience and long suffering. That means suffering for long without losing your temper. And you ask God for help. Now your wife can say anything and you smile. It is a ministry of the Holy Spirit in you. And you are able now to deal with her. And you have a wonderful marriage. Not because your wife has changed, <laughs> but because the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. We are answering the question, why does God give marriage despite so many challenges? Because he knows every one of us are his children. And because we are his children, he loves us enough to give us somebody <laughs> who can be the one with the ministry. Am I communicating? I know we all talk about pastors. Pastors, forgive me. But if your spouse is not your primary pastor, please accept my sympathy in advance. Am I communicating? The biggest responsibility of any spouse is to be a pastor to the spouse. To be the kind of a person who is going to listen, who is going to minister, who is going to pray, but most important, who accept the person the way they are. So we are saying the reason God puts us in families is so that we have a companion for life. Do you know something? If somebody is annoying you, like a, as a boss annoying you, you are ready to resign. Am I right? So you don't invest a lot of time with a guy you are leaving. You just relate him. The trouble with your wife is there is no resignation date. So you must find a way of dealing with her. Because you stay with her for for life. But that's the negative side. The positive side is to realize even your own siblings. Own siblings. I still remember in the 1990s, there were a lot of redundancies. And I used to try to go from house to house witnessing. And I still remember going to a house to witness because I think this, if you are here and I'm talking about you, forgive me. But this was a guy who had been murdered, murdered, murdered um, jobless by a bank. And you know, the wife was explaining to me, because the guy was very depressed, was explaining to me, can you imagine these people misuse my husband? He was the one organizing redundancies for everybody. So he thought him he was staying. Once everyone was fired, the, ch the, the, the chair, I think the chairman of the company came and said, you have done a wonderful job, you are the next. Now you can understand how hard thing that can be, isn't it? But that's not, according to what they told me, that's not the most painful thing. They were planning to go to their village to tell the parents what has happened, because then, of course, they will not be able to help. Do you know before they could reach there, their own siblings, and according to the wife, they are the ones who educated those younger siblings. He told, she told me, all of them passed through my house until they got jobs. They, as soon as they had their older brother, is jobless. They ran home to tell their father, let him see what we see. In other words, they are rejoicing that their rich brother is jobless. And he says, the wife told me that was so painful, my husband could hardly face it. That's why we are ready to hear you. And obviously, I was able to give them what the Bible says in times of encouragement. You know, your own siblings are rejoicing when you are in trouble. But you know your trouble is your wife's trouble. Am I communicating? So when she receives you, she is in a measure of pain similar to yours. That idea of long-term relationship with your wife means even when she gets annoyed, she thinks about the solution long-term. Am I right? 
especially if she's a Christian woman. Of course, if she's not Christian, it could easily dump you. But this one is a Christian woman I'm talking about. She knows she was set there for a reason. And she would do it. So we need to understand the reason why God puts us in families is to give you a person who cannot resign unless they want to go to hell. They stay with you through the can thin. Not because they love you, not because you are a good guy, but because the Spirit of God tells them to stay. Can you see the gift God has given you? And it's important. That's why we must fight this new idea of making divorce like normal. <laughs> the other day, a church, a church wrote to me to tell me to go and talk to them about how to minister to divorcees. So I asked them, I don't even accept it. How am I going to minister like that? It's the hardest invitation I've ever had. I'd ask God, do you really want me to talk about this? Because you need, we are starting to make divorce so normal. <laughs> it's another department in church. Now, you need to ask yourself, what is the implication to the children when they realize divorce is normal? Are you getting surprised that people below 40, the other day a young couple came to see us, and they said, it's not that we have a big problem, but you have looked back to our primarital class. Out of 10, same people who are our friends, in five years, half of them are not staying together. They explained to me, it's not that they, they are necessarily divorced. Some of them even stay in different houses, but come to church, and when they come to church, they sit together. So the pastor thinks they are still, but we are friends. We know they left each other a long time ago. You know, it was the girl talking. I turned to the man and asked, is that true? In five years? Yes, I said, Brother Nanga, if you want, I can give you the names. And now, I was in shock. As I went to tell my wife, we start working with them. I was in shock. Now it's no longer shocking. We have made marriage like conditional. In other words, if you treat me right, I will stay. You treat me wrong, wrong, I will leave. Normal family problems are now being called traumatizing. What did your husband do? He was always snoring, so I was traumatized. <laughs> so what do you want? I'm leaving him. Now, what can your husband do about... He is not even aware he snores. Now, you need to understand. You need to understand something has gone wrong. The Bible doesn't change, but you have changed our understanding of it. Am I right? That, that you feel now the way he, uh, he keeps complaining. Therefore, because he's complaining, I'll leave him. And I can't remember the word they are using. There's a word they are using. We were discussing my wife the other day, the word they are using about being, being traumatized. So it's, and, it, and it's being taught in psychology. So the way to deal with the matter is leave the guy, otherwise you'll end up in depression. As if God did not know it will happen, and he needs to prepare you with a tough skin that can handle this guy. Am I communicating? Because it's about marrying, getting married to a lioness. And yet God is not allowing you to live the lioness. So what does he do? Teaching you domesticating skills. You, you don't want to learn that lesson. You want to dump the guy. And if you disobey the scriptures that tell you divorce is sin, it will be okay to divorce on your way to hell. So it's a choice you have to make. Am I communicating? It's a choice. You, you know, we have reached a level where people are going against God's word and still claiming to go to heaven. Isn't that what the guy in Malidi did? The word of God says, thou shalt not commit murder. You shall, shall not kill. Then he is telling people, don't forget about the Bible. If you commit suicide, you just go to heaven straight. In other words, break God's command and yet go to meet him. Which heaven can that be? Where you have broken God's command and your intention is to see him. And you're having those kind of people who are divorcing right, left, center on their way to heaven. Which heaven? You need to understand as we talk about this family issue that God intends the families to stay together. But yet, he is not stopping people being men or women with all their weaknesses. It's only you need to create a, a home where you accept one another. That means if your wife is quarrelsome, 
You try to talk to her to stop being quarrelsome. But if you, when you are defeated, admit only God can handle this woman. Talk to God about this woman. But before she changes, say, by that time I may be, be in hospital, handle me. And God is able to give you the kind of understanding where every quarrel makes you smile. Because you have known that a regular, of, a regular way of dealing with you is by quarreling you. So when she quarrels you, it's normal. When she doesn't, it's abnormal. So it, it no longer traumatizes you when she quarrels you because you expect it. Am I communicating? But we are being taught things that are not the scriptures. That the way to handle those kind of people is to leave them. No wonder marriages no longer last. And you know that thing is real. Even people are being taught, do not have, do not care about people going nowhere. That means, and the churches are accepting those, that idea of, um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, you, those are positive thinkers, where they tell you, pick friends who are going somewhere, if you want to go somewhere. In other words, if you see people going nowhere, leave them to go nowhere. Which scriptures are you using? Because the word of God, he came according to John 3, 16, because he loved the world. And the world is full of weak people. Am I right? If you have the love of God, you also must love them. And I'm not suggesting that you make them your friends and your poles, but it means you cry with the people that are going nowhere so that you, you are able to seek God's help. And it's a serious matter. I'm not playing down on it. It's a serious matter. But you must learn that marriage and family must be a place where challenges can be there, but you know a God who can help you through the challenges. However, I have to be quick to say, it doesn't mean that you allow violence. Because if you stay with a woman who intends to kill you, you will be participating in committing suicide. So if you know she's planning to kill you, leave her. You don't divorce her, you separate, so that you give time for counseling. Do you want her to go to hell? No, she needs help. But in the meanwhile, don't stay in the same house. Don't give her a chance to kill you. Find a way of separation. There is nothing understood from the scriptures that is wrong about separating to allow time for healing. Am I communicating? Similarly, you have a man who is sleeping with anybody and everybody. And in the days of HIV, it means both of you will die and your children will have no parent. Am I right? Just the other guy. Until you are able to zip up, that is your bedroom. Don't come to this one. I love you as a husband, but I don't want both of us to, to die. So it means adultery is not something we are suggesting you continue normally with an immoral husband. But that still does not require di di divorce. Why? The God we believe in can turn an immoral man back to the Lord. Do you believe in a God like that? Now, when he comes back to the Lord, and he wants to be in marriage, and you have divorced him and married somebody else. Can you see the complexity? So you need to understand that it is that patience, that understanding of God's calling into marriage, that is actually missing. But I'm not playing down. I do know that you must also care for your psychological health. But please ask yourself, is the way out always to run away from the problem, or is there a God who can help you? Is there counseling? that can help you to know how to handle this difficult person? And is there a way this other person can be helped at all to stop being the rough person he actually is? Now, I, I've looked at my watch, I realize the time is far gone. But in finishing, <laughs> time has just run away. Let me remind you, Verse, Matthew 19, verse 12 says, For some are eunuchs, because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. Others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. What we are learning is that some people are caught to singlehood, and I've referred to it. And those people don't push them to get married. I never push young people to get married because I know there are people who will fulfill God's purposes by not getting married.
and it's important. So why do you get married? Because for you, you are called to marriage. When you are called to marriage, what are you called to? To handle a lion. To handle a lioness. And if you try to be single, and you are called to marriage, you will live a dissatisfied life. The other day, I was so, somebody, we were talking to some, 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 I think it was a meeting of widows. And they were saying, what is it you miss about the loss of your husband? And one of them said, the way he used to quarrel me. And others laughed. But that's what he misses. Because he got, she got used to it. She loved him. She enjoyed him. Then he died. So every time she wakes, she remembers there's nobody to quarrel me. Now you need to understand. Then another person I was, I was, I was dealing with. I think it's a senior, senior person in the corporate world. I was preaching in their church. And I preached in many churches. So don't try to guess which one. And she told me after the meeting, she told me, Brother John, I want to ask you a question. But I know the answer. So I asked, why are you asking me? Let me still ask you. She explained that she was doing very well economically. The husband was contributing nothing. Until she asked herself, how can I stay with a man going nowhere? So she told him, there was so little in the house he was associated with. He was told, can you pack? He did not require more than his suitcase. And he left. And so she now became, but she was an un-Christian. So she, she still continued living as an un-Christian and married girl. Then she came to the Lord. Once she was saved, she realized, number one, you cannot start sleeping out on your way to heaven. Number two, it means that as long as your husband is alive, there is trouble of remarriage, which is a question she was, she was asking me. But you know me, brother, Nanga, I'm so lonely. I enter my house, it's a big house, and I keep wishing I had retained that useless man just to have some noise. But now he went and it's done. But I'm really suffering from loneliness. You need to understand the reason God gave you marriage is not just so that you have a wonderful guy, but so that you have a companion. Am I communicating? The failure of marriage is not financial. The failure of marriage is lack of companionship. And it's very, very important to understand that. So, the word of God is calling marriage a calling. And I think that's very important. You will feel fulfilled when you get object to receive your gift of happiness and joy. In marriage, you don't go to marriage in order to get. You go to marriage in order to give. And the trouble with many marriages is they are looking to get. I was telling, I was speaking in Sita Mnieri last week in their, in their marriage in the dinner, that in Christian marriage, it's not 50-50. Each must give 100. And that's why a marriage can last even when the woman is giving absolutely nothing. And the marriage will see you last. It can only last because you are depending on Christ. Are we together? And he's actually helping you. You get fulfillment is what we are, we are learning. And of course, I've emphasized the fact that it's a cure for loneliness. And he, it makes you a team that can accurately... Let me just finish by looking at Malachi 2.15. Has not the Lord them one? In flesh and spirit, they are his. And why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So God in your spirit... And do not break faith with the wife of your. And it doesn't say if she is good. It doesn't say if she is still beautiful. Maybe you married her figure eight. But of course, after three or four children, she's more. Valuable. Understand clearly, it is we are not being told that she has remained the way she was. You are simply saying, stay with the wife of your. Or stay with the husband of your youth. But why? The question is, why must I stay? This guy is not even interesting to live with. Because God is looking for a godly offspring. You can imagine, and I've written a book called Long Term View of Marriage, which uh, Bishop Adoyo has written the forward. Because to qualify to write it, you needed to be married for more than 40 years to write anything in it. 
Because my idea, I've called it long-term view of marriage, in order to say, don't start looking for options to leave your marriage earlier. The moment you are committed to that long, long term, you will think about the impact on your children. And my book looks at the, the many marriages where people go apart and the children are ruined. In fact, research shows that if you go to a prison, the majority of the people in prison come from broken homes. So that as you run away from your husband, please know you are condemning your children and yet they never participated in you coming together. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, these are easy things to say, difficult to practice. But you have stated in Malachi exactly why you want us to stay in marriages. Because if we stay in marriages, we ensure the next generation will be worshippers. That they will know God. That they will trust him. And yet, staying in our marriages, there are so many challenges. That unless you come to it, most of us will give up earlier than the time you call us home. I'm praying for every marriage, every family represented here, that as they go back out of this church, you will challenge us to believe you are able to help us to sustain our time in marriage. But I'm also praying for people that are the ones causing difficulties, that they will understand that as they cause difficulties in their own marriages, God will hold them to account for being difficult women or difficult men or difficult fathers that you intend to punish those type of people. So help us not to be the people, the people that are causing breakage in marriage. That we ourselves will do our very best to minister to our spouses. We need your help, Lord. Come through for us. In Jesus' name.